He is risen. He is risen indeed. That is the exclamation of Easter. And today is a day of celebration, even if it doesn't feel quite right, since we're unable to worship together in person, since some of the things that we usually expect to happen on this day simply won't be happening. It doesn't matter. It's still a celebration. And it would be easy to focus on what we don't have, the things that we expected to find that we don't. But if we do that, then we fall prey to what happened to those women who went to the tomb in Mark's gospel. In Mark's gospel, we don't have an awful lot of detail. The women, who are actually named in this account, come to the tomb and they expected to go and anoint the already decaying body of Jesus. And their only concern is, how are we going to get into the tomb? There's going to be an enormous stone. How can we roll it away? So they get there, and there is no stone. It's been rolled away, and they look in, and the tomb is empty. And sitting on the right side is a man dressed in white. That's all Mark says. And before they're able to ask the question, he answers it. Jesus, the Nazarene, the one nailed to the cross, he is not here. The tomb is empty. Go ahead and tell the other disciples, especially Peter, that he will meet you and them in Galilee like he said he would. Now, here's where it gets interesting. They go out of there. As Peterson puts it, their heads are swimming. They're astonished. They're alarmed. They're astounded. They're afraid. They didn't get what they expected. And even though what they got was far greater than they could have imagined, they simply, at this point, cannot wrap their heads around it. They're so caught up in what was missing. Now, Mark's ending is so abrupt, it's pretty unsatisfying. It's actually more than anticlimactic. The women don't do anything. They leave paralyzed by their fear. And this ending was so problematic for some is that people wrote extra endings to the Gospel of Mark. You can find them in some translations, verses 9 and following. But the earliest records we have, actual manuscripts of Mark's Gospel, have it end here. So scholars believe that's what Mark intended. Now the question, why? Well, the best answer, and there's a pretty much a consensus about this, is that Mark ended it this way, with the women not doing anything, abruptly, harshly, because he wants us to feel compelled to jump into the story ourselves. In other words, this ending is so sharp, if you will, that we have nothing to do but jump in and run with it where the women weren't able to. He wants us to continue to tell the story, those of us who read it years, even thousands of years later. It's up to us. So what's the story that we have to tell? Easter is about resurrection, but what does that mean? Too often, we have been abrupt and not quite as faithful as we could have been when we assume that resurrection is all about our past sins being forgiven and our future with heaven being assured. And yes, it is about that, but it's not just about that or even primarily about that. We see resurrection as a past event which determines our future, but resurrection is all about how we live our lives as God's people in the present. Resurrection is life from death, hope from hopelessness, joy in the midst of sorrow, faith in spite of what happened on Good Friday, faith because of what happened the third day later. Resurrection has its greatest impact in the present. So, we are worshiping together via, for many of us, in a way that we never expected. We certainly didn't expect it last year, and I don't think most of us thought we'd still be doing it this year. But let me tell you, I have people at Our Savior that are able to, via the phone, worship together for the first time in years, and they've been doing it this entire time during the pandemic. This is a challenge, but it is also an opportunity, and it's a blessing. 
COVID may be our context, but it doesn't define us who we are. This is a time in history we simply need to get through, and we are doing it. And it brings challenges and opportunities. And resurrection reminds us that we meet both of these from the perspective of faith in a God who conquered death and wants us to live. The challenge and the opportunity is to live as resurrected people, not only in these times, but all times. The opportunity is knowing that death doesn't have the final say. The challenge is to live accepting what is before us and then trying to do our best to make it better, not only for ourselves, but for others. And all around me, I see challenges and opportunities and evidence of resurrection. For example, when I signed up for meals from Crossroads, which is a ministry in the spring from the First United Methodist Church, as the lady was taking my information, she said a lot of people were purchasing extra meals and giving them to folks. So I did that. Life-giving and nourishing meals prepared that I can share with other people. What a blessing. I look out the window from my kitchen and I look at my salad raised garden bed and what, three, four weeks ago, it was covered with two feet of snow. And I look out today and there is lettuce growing. In fact, there's more lettuce growing in one spot that grew during the summer. <laughs> Life from death. All around, I see flowers popping up that were planted as bulbs last fall or maybe many, many falls ago. Daffodils are so cheerful and trees that are flowering are coming out and it reminds us of this sign, cycle of life and death and life which is part of the world in which we live and for me that's a symbol of resurrection hope. When we live as inheritors of the resurrection, that means that the challenges of life don't need to overwhelm us. Like the women at the tomb, we may be afraid or stunned or alarmed, but we can move on from that. Now I grant you, the challenges of life can sometimes push us to the very brink of despair. But resurrection says, even in those darkest moments, there is hope. Joy is possible in the midst of sorrow because it's rooted in a God who came to earth and lived among us and died for us and then was raised from the dead. When we say he is risen, he is risen indeed, we are affirming our faith in God's reign here on earth. And that kingdom in which we participate has everything to do with following God and allowing God's guidance to infuse us with a sense of resurrection, hope, and dreams, and possibilities. Now, living resurrected lives doesn't mean our lives will be problem-free. Not all endings are happy ones. Life isn't always fair. But our faith allows us to meet those challenges and turn them into opportunities to learn and grow. Our faith enables us to care for one another so that life can be more fair. Our faith empowers us to go out and seek justice and to change people and systems so that the world can be a more equitable place for all of God's children. We can continue to have hope and work so that everyone experiences that same hope. I want to close with a true story, and I think it gives us an amazing example of what living resurrected lives can be. Dick Hoyt came into competitive running late in life, didn't start till his 40s, and he uh, ended up running 32 Boston marathons, numerous duathlons and triathlons, including the Ironman. He ran a cross-country race of over 3,700 miles. When all was said and done, he ran over 1,000 races. And he did all of them, pushing his son Rick in front of him in a specially made wheelchair. Rick, born with um, cerebral palsy, was a quadriplegic. And it all started, according to their website, like this. Rick saw an article about a lacrosse player in college who was injured, and he wanted to do something to help, and there was a 5K run. And he said, Dad, is there anything we can do? His dad, who was a recreational runner, said, sure. That was their first race. They came in next to last. 
But that's what started it, because Rick told his father, Dad, when we're running, I don't feel like I'm disabled. Their website, Team Hoy, tells this story, and that website has raised awareness and funds and helped disabled athletes all over the place. For me, both Dick and Rick are examples of folks who live resurrected lives. Rick was one of those folks who folks probably thought never could participate in life, but he was able to do things and be a part of things in ways that they couldn't have imagined. Dick worked through a heart condition that he had, and up until his death two weeks ago, um, at 80, was able to run with his son. And that website reached hundreds and thousands of people and changed the way people view differently abled athletes in sport. And for me, both of these lives are examples of resurrection because they and other folks that we know of or read about remind us that the power of resurrection tells us that life conquers death, hope endures, joy is possible even in the most dire of circumstances, and God's love is felt in the power of the resurrection as our past is forgiven, our future is ensured, and our present is full of possibilities for lives of abundance. So let's take up Mark's charge and continue the story. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen.